In this video, we're going to talk about the many layers that make up the abdominal wall. As we talked about in our previous video introducing the surface anatomy of the abdomen, the abdominal wall uh, protects the many visceral organs that are inside the abdomen. The way I like to go over this is by putting yourself in a scenario. So let's pretend that you're in the operating room or in an anatomy lab, and you're about to do an exploratory laparotomy. In order for you to get into the abdominal cavity and see all the enclosed organs, you have to go through many layers of skin, fascia, and muscle. So let's say we're back in the OR and we're ready to make our first incision. Starting from superficial to deep or from the outermost layer to the innermost layer, the first thing you will encounter of course is the skin. So we just made our, our first cut and we've taken care of, of the skin. The first thing you will come across deep to the skin is the, the two layers of the superficial fascia. So you will first see a layer of fat that's called campers fascia, as you can see here. And right on, underneath that, you have the other part of the superficial fascia, which is a more membranous layer called scarpa's fascia. So you can see right here. And scarpa's fascia will firmly attach to the linea alba and the symphysis pubis, which are just these midline structures you can see right over here. Moving deeper below the superficial layer of fascia, then you will counter the muscular layer. So you will have five different muscles, which are split into two groups. You have the flat muscles and the vertical muscles. And as you keep moving deeper into the abdomen, you will encounter the transverse house fascia. Immediately deep to that, you have the extra peritoneal fascia. And then lastly, you will come across the peritoneum. So that was just a brief overview of the layers of the abdominal wall. Let's explore each of these in a little more detail though. So going back to our example, you're back in the OR or in the lab and you've gone through the skin and you've come across this uh, campers fascia and this rapus fascia and you've gone through that too. And now you come across this big layer of multiple muscles. So let's explore those a little more. The muscular layer of the abdomen is composed of five main muscle groups. These muscle groups are split into the flat muscles and the vertical muscles. Starting with the flat muscles, these are what you may know as the obliques. So you start uh, with the external oblique, move uh, deeper into the internal oblique, and then end with the transversus abdominis. And all these muscles have something in common, and it's that they begin posterior laterally, and they move anteriorly, meaning towards the front. And as they move anteriorly, they're replaced by what's called an aponeurosis that connects them to the abdominal midline. So those are the three flat muscles. And you also have two groups of vertical muscles. And the first one is the rectus abdominis, which you may know as your six pack muscles. And then you also have a small uh, muscle group called the pyramidalis, which you can see right over here. So continuing with the example that we came up with in which you're in the OR, and you went through the fascia and now you, you came across the muscular layer. You wanna be able to figure out ways to identify what muscle you are looking at. So we know that the first muscle or the most superficial one is the external oblique, which you can see over here. And the way that you can identify the external oblique is by looking at the way the fibers are pointing at. So the external oblique has fibers that point inferior medially, meaning they're pointing down and to the middle. So if we had to give it a directional arrow, it would look something like this. And uh, the way I like to, to remember the way the external oblique points or the fibers directions is by just thinking of how you put your hands in your, in your pockets. When you're putting your hands in, in your pockets, your fingers are, are facing down and towards the middle. And that's exactly how the direction of the external oblique is. Immediately deep to the external oblique, we have the internal oblique, which in this diagram you can somewhat see around here. And the way I like to think of the internal oblique is the opposite of the external oblique. As I said before, we know that these muscles all start in the back so they all have to start by pointing towards the middle. And if we're thinking of the opposite of the external oblique, we know the external oblique points down, the internal oblique points up. So its fibers point superior medially. If we superimpose that to the external oblique arrow, it will look something like this. So it's pointing up and towards the middle. And then immediately deep to the internal oblique, we have the last of the flat muscle groups, which is the transversus abdominis, which you can see right around here. And the transversus abdominis fibers don't point up or down, they simply go towards the middle. So you can see around here, they're just horizontal fibers. And so our arrow just goes straight towards the middle. All three of these flat muscles are covered anteriorly and posteriorly by a layer of deep fascia. This is separate from the superficial fascia that we uh, called campers and, and scarpus. But the one fascia that you want to know about these muscles is the transversalis fascia, which is deep 
to the transversal abdominis. So if you see uh, the picture on the right, you can see the transversalis fascia deep to the transversus abdominis. When compared to the other muscular fascia, this fascia is slightly more developed than the other ones. We talked about our flat muscles. I also mentioned that there were two vertical muscles. So the first vertical muscle to know is the rectus abdominis, as you can see over here. This muscle group is paired, meaning you have one in each side of the body, and it's separated vertically by the linea alba that you can see right over here. The linea alba is simply where all this aponeurosis and all these muscles intersect in the middle of the body. But you can also notice that even horizontally, this rectus abdominis is split into groups too. And this horizontal intersections are called transverse fibrous bands or tendinous intersections. So this muscle group is also known as the six pack muscles. And in muscular individuals with low percentages of body fat, you can easily visualize each of these muscle groups. And then the last muscle I wanted to talk about is the pyramidalis, which is this little muscle that's anterior to the rectus. And it's a small triangular muscle, which is why it's called the pyramidalis. And its base is on the pubis, and it also attaches to the linea alba. And a fun fact to know about this muscle is that not everyone has a pyramidalis muscle. The last thing I wanna talk about regarding this muscle is what's called the rectus sheath, which is a very important concept. So these two vertical muscles are enclosed by what we call the rectus sheath. Remember those three flat muscles we talked about before? Their fibers have this aponeurosis as they come towards the anterior and the middle that connect to the linea alba. And so this aponeurosis is what makes up the rectus sheath. So if you think about it anteriorly, the end of these three flat muscles is what makes up the rectus sheath which encloses the vertical muscles. And you might be wondering why any of this is important. Well, the rectus sheath is a very important structure and it's actually anatomically fascinating because it changes based on where in the abdomen you are. So it's important to pay attention to this. Tests and your attendings love asking you about the rectus sheath. First of all, just based on depth, we call the rectus sheath anterior or posterior based on if it's covering the muscles or if it's behind the muscles. So the sheath that's directly anterior to the rectus abdominis is the anterior sheath, and the sheath that's posterior to the rectus abdominis is the posterior sheath. The anterior sheath, which you can kind of see over here, covers the full length of the abdomen, but the posterior sheath is the one that only covers the upper three fourths of the abdomen, meaning that the lower fourth of the posterior rectus sheath is not there. What this means is that that lower fourth posterior to the rectus abdominis, it's in direct contact with the transalis fascia, which is what you can see over here. You see how you have this posterior sheath extending the upper three fourths, and then you have the transalis fascia right below that because there is no posterior sheath below that line, which is what's called the arcuate line. This is all very confusing and it's it can be somewhat difficult to visualize. The big points to know are that the three flat muscles converge into the linea alba and their aponeurosis forms the rectus sheath, which is anterior if in front of the muscles or posterior if deep to the muscles. The anterior sheath covers the full abdomen. The posterior sheath only covers the upper three fourths, meaning anything below the arcuate line, which is right below the umbilicus, is not covered by the posterior sheath. So that muscle group right here will be in direct contact with the transversalis fascia. So let's move on to that better picture now. This picture right here shows you the rectus sheath going from superficial to deep. So we have our linea alba here, and then we have our most superficial of the muscles, the external oblique in the top, and then the transversus abdominis, which is the deepest of the muscles below. Our green line here is the transversalis fascia, and then our yellow line is the parietal peritoneum. So this, this side right here is superficial, this side right here is deep. So when I was first learning this, the one of the first confusing points I came across was how do three different muscle aponeuroses cover the front and the back at the same time? And so I think this picture does a good job at illustrating that. The external oblique covers the anterior part, so it makes up the anterior sheet. The internal oblique splits into the anterior and posterior right at the midline, and then the transalis fascia just covers the posterior sheet. So just as a, as a reminder, as we said before, anything in front of this muscle group, so right here, is anterior, and then the stuff right deep to this muscle will be the posterior sheet. Now I'll ask you to look at the picture below. 
So this is also a representation of the rectus sheath, but this is in that lower uh, one fourth of the abdomen. So this is below the arcuate line. So we know that the anterior sheath is going to be present because the anterior sheath covers the full width of the abdomen, but we can notice that there's nothing posteriorly. And the way this works is as soon as we cross that arcuate line, what this muscles do, instead of splitting into anterior and posterior, the aponeurosis of all three muscles converge in the middle. So they all uh, attach to the linea alba anteriorly to the rectus abdominis muscles. And so as we can see over here, we don't have any posterior sheath and this rectus abdominis muscle is in direct contact with the transversalis fascia. So if there's one thing I want you to remember from this video is that location matters in the sense that anything below the arcuate line doesn't have a posterior sheath. And of course, you might be wondering why, again, is this important? And besides the fact that they love asking this in tests or in the hospital, the reason is that because you don't have a posterior sheath, you're also more susceptible to having um, hernias because this is a weakened area of, of the abdomen. Another important cool fact is that, for instance, if you're in the OR, you're doing a C-section and you're, you're making your incisions, you shouldn't expect to see a posterior sheet because you should be making that incision below the arcuate line. So don't be worried if you don't see that layer of posterior sheath as you go through the C-section. We spent a long time talking about muscles because they had some important concepts, but now let's finish going through the layers of the abdominal wall. At this point, we've gone through the skin, we've gone through campers and scarpus fascia, we've gone through the separate muscle layers, and we got to the transversalis fascia. Now, deep to the transversalis fascia, we have a layer which we call the extraperitoneal fascia, which simply serves as a separation between the transversalis fascia and the peritoneum. This layer is mostly composed of fat and has different names based on where it is. If it's on the anterior side of the body, as in around here, this uh, layer is called the preperitoneal fascia. And if it's on the posterior side of the body, as you can see over here, now we call this retroperitoneal. And lastly, uh, as we move through that preperitoneal or retroperitoneal layer, we finally come across the peritoneal. And the first part of the peritoneum you will encounter is the parietal peritoneum, which is the one that lines the abdominal wall. And then deep to that, you'll have the visceral peritoneum, which lies uh, or covers the visceral organs itself. And here is our abdomen. So you'd have to go through all these layers to reach the abdominal cavity, which contains those organs. So now let's sum things up. You are back in that OR and you're making this cut. You will first come across the skin. You will move down to the subcutaneous fat or campers fascia. Then you will come across scarpus fascia, and now you will come across the different muscular layers. If you're more on the side, you will come across the external oblique, then the internal oblique, and then the transversus of abdominis. As you go down through that muscular layer, you will end with the transversalis fascia, then you will come across the preperitoneal fat or preperitoneal fascia, and you will finally reach the peritoneum. Now, if you were right around the midline, you will also come across the rectus abdominis. So now you'll come across skin, subcutaneous fat, scarpus fascia, anterior sheath, rectus abdominis, posterior sheath, and then you go back to that transversalis fascia, peritone peritoneal fat, and the peritoneum. And then trick question, if you're below the arcuate line, so below the, the umbilicus, you come across skin, subcutaneous fat, scarpus fascia, anterior sheath, rectus abdominis, no posterior sheath, and now you have transversalis fascia, preperitoneal fat, and the peritoneum. So that was a lot. But this is a very important concept in surgery, anatomy, and just medicine in general to know. Um, it's important to know where the arcuate line is. And again, as I said before, if there's one thing I want you to get from this video, it's at least to know that below the arcuate line, you don't have a posterior sheath. So thank you so much for watching this video. If you got this far, please give this video a like. Comment below if you have any questions or if you want us to make a video about any other different topic. And lastly, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future videos. I did mention hernias before, and I'll just let you know that the next video to watch out for should be about hernias.